Well, hello and welcome again to another one of our little podcasts. This is uh, Hugh Waters over here in Gloucestershire and I've got Phil in Route 6 over there in London. And today we have uh, yet another special guest. This is Lawrence Clayton, our second guest. And we thought we'd have a little treat today. We'd um, go off to the cinema or rather we'd find out how the cinema comes off to you because Lawrence knows about that sort of thing being technical director at Deluxe in London and we're going to be uh, asking him lots of impertinent questions about D cinema and all the workings thereof so Lawrence there you yeah. are Hello. perhaps you'd like to just give us a little introduction to to you your history and you know how did you get to be here what did you do so wrong uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I didn't uh, train to work in this industry. Uh, I, I studied electronic engineering um, at uh, university. Um, and whilst I was at university, I got involved with um, the Film Society there um, and uh, became the, the technical officer, as was at the time. And uh, during that time, I got an, int I got an interest in... Um, uh, in, in cinema and film. Um, traditionally, I probably wanted to be an engineer, perhaps in sound or broadcast or something like that, but I got an interest in cinema um, and took that through to my first job, which was a support engineer. Um, I then went to work for Technicolor for three years. Um, after working for Technicolor, uh, I took a job with my original employer, um, a guy called Max Bell, a stalwart of the, uh, the film industry, um, former Dolby employee. Um, and uh, worked on ways of uh, encouraging uh, digital cinema, um, early digital cinema projection equipment into post-production. Um, and that was an interesting time because uh, when I left Technicolor, digital cinema was very much in its infancy. It was a piece mm. of R&D. Uh, when I left, we realized the only way to get a digital copy of the movie was to uh, make sure that the DI process was done. Otherwise, you'd have to go and scan the interpositive and do all of that rather expensive um, processing at the end of the, um, the normal post-production process. So it was really about promoting digital intermediate. Um, so we did a lot of work uh, with some of the early pioneers of, um, of digital intermediate. Uh, we did some work with Molinaire, with Midnight Transfer, with Capital Effects, um, which was later acquired by Deluxe. Um, with uh, um, a freelancer called Peter Doyle, who worked on a number of the Harry Potter movies, having just come off of uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, so we are able to promote this process and start bringing some of the digital projection technology that was then new into DI. And the big sell was trying to make it look like film. Yeah. And uh, the early stuff didn't. Um, color management wasn't right. The projection technology wasn't quite there yet. But um, when the 2K platform was released back in 2004, that really brought the kind of quality and the kind of contrast ratio that was required um, to, um, to, to the, the digital post-production process. Lawrence, can and I just interrupt? Yeah, yeah sure. Just for a second. When, on the contrast ratio, just give us a, a, an idea of what the what the differences are between telly and and cinema that we're trying to strive for. Well, um, TV with old um, cathode ray tubes was technically capable of incredibly high contrast ratios, um, and the reason being, you could turn the phosphors off. Um, so, if you've got a phosphor that's off, um, you don't get any um, you, you don't get any light at all. So, if you're in a dark room, it's zero. So you can get 10,000, maybe higher contrast ratios, 10,000 is, is Dynamic. That, hasn't that always been a tad misleading because because you get to, you get internal reflection with it? With a CRT, you can turn a phosphor off and you get zero light. Um, but obviously, if you've got a, a filter as a checkerboard where you've got um, white areas of the screen and dark areas, um, you get uh, flare and fogging as a result of, uh, of, of this through the CRT um, glass at the front and also from behind the phosphors within the body of the CRT itself. Um, the same is true of projected in images in cinemas. Uh, you don't always have a completely black box, um, so any light that's projected off the screen goes out uh, into the auditorium and is then reflected back onto the darker areas of the screen, reducing the contrast. Um, and the same is also true due to ambient light in the um, 
the theatre, which is for exit lights, um, for stair lighting, and just general lighting. It has to be there for health and safety purposes. Um, typical projected contrast ratio uh, is, is around 400 to 1, um, and that's oh, even for a 35 millimeter film. Really? But that so that back in the early days of digital cinema, we were we were struggling even to achieve that. I, I think you were saying is that is that correct? We we were, but the other issue was because the uh, the DLP technology at the time, and even earlier than that, the huge JVC technology couldn't completely darken a, a, an individual pixel. Um, you always had this sort of grey wash over the screen. Um, so it was only around um, late 2003, early 2004, where we were getting contrast ratio above 1,400, 1,500 to 1, where it was really comparable, that sort of black level, if you like, was really comparable to what we were achieving on, an, on, a, on a good average release print. Yeah. And release prints themselves also have very varying levels of um, contrast uh, as well. So um, a, good, a good release print would be um, 2,000 to 1 plus. Oh, right. OK. So a good, healthy ratio there. So that takes us, what, to the early 2000s. And then we've, we've got some new, new projectors coming through. Which, so how are they achieving this betterness? Is that, is that simply from having grey screens or is that it, it, what's actually happened to, to improve that uh, contrast uh, ratio? Texas Instruments put a lot of uh, R&D into, into the chips. And I've actually got one here. Um, just going to his museum. Um, these are the um, DLP chips within the projector. Um, like yeah. I said, at the stage, there are other projection technologies. Um, but essentially, each of these is made up of uh, um, thousands of micromirrors. Um, micromirror, um, if I can use this, um, if you assume this is a single pixel, and it's got a mirror on it. Um, the way it works is by tilting the mirror on and off, oh. like this. Um, yeah. And when it's in the off state, the idea is that no other reflected light should pass through. Um, so it's either reflect it through the lens like that, um, or it reflects it onto a heat sink, which is at the top of the light engine. Um, now, one of the things they did back then was to increase the amount each pixel tilted. Um, and this went up to, about, I think, about 17 degrees. Um, I don't know if that figure is absolutely correct. Right. Oh, so, so it's modest to 17 degrees, not kind of like 90 degrees. You're totally throwing no, the lights away. It's 17 degrees. Wow. And um, these, these little micro mirrors are quite... Um, quite an interesting piece of technology because um, firstly uh, they're very very small um, they're probably uh, one of the few commercial uses of what is now known as nanotechnology um, and uh, they sit in a pair of bearings which themselves are made of silicon um, and they shut turn on and off um, you know um, several times you know several hundred times per second um, I forget what the current refresh rates are but um, they, they turn on and off very quickly um, and those bearings actually are run hot, and they don't ever wear out because the silicon is molten. Um, <laughs> very interesting piece of technology. Um, wow. But uh, the other thing was, behind each pixel, we had to make sure they Texas Instruments had to make sure that the substrate was black, um, which required various doping and various other things they do to silicon in order to make it black. And the final thing is, each each, each silicon mirror was held on with a sort of, uh, it wasn't a screw or a rivet, but it was sort of the nanotechnology equivalent, which usually left a little hole in the middle, and obviously that would tend to reflect light through. So there were a number of refinements that were made in the early days to the process, um, and uh, also to things like reject rate, because these, these had a quite high reject rate to start with, um, to improve the contrast ratio of these devices and the onward optics. So um, there was a lot of work went into that, and really when it got to the point in about 2004, 2005, it was good enough for a, um, to, to really replace film. Um, that's when we started taking it out there and showing the creative people, this is actually, a good, this is actually good for you to do your post-production digitally. Um, we're there now. Um, and we slowly sort of took these machines around, um, took them onto, onto set, um, then we started doing audience reaction screenings with them. Then we started doing press screenings with them. And then after a while, the creatives were happy enough um, that uh, that we can do premieres with them. Um, so even though the post-production process is, it was digital, a lot of the creatives and the directors felt we still want to go to film for our release. Uh, but yeah. we actually managed to persuade them that the, the digital was actually slightly better on quality ground. 
Okay, um, so I, quick, quick, yeah. quick, quick question: What proportion of kind of local flea pits have now got pro digital projectors in and, and a server to serve that all up? And 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 how many release prints are still going out on on thirty five millimeter celluloid? Do you think what, what's the proportions? Uh, well, the thirty five millimeter release prints um, since last year, the the requirement from them has gone from the hundreds down into the tens, and it's now in single digits. It's really? Oh. Um, Norway became 100% converted last year. Um, the United Kingdom is probably over 85% of screens converted. Um, and uh, as you describe, even the, the small independent cinemas are um, now largely converted through various financing options that are available. So uh, it, it's the conversion in Europe is, is, is very close to being complete in the next, um, in, in the next uh, 18 months. Um, there are a few territories that are lagging behind. Um, Spain is uh, still only 60% complete um, for various uh, financial reasons, uh, but the, the, the conversion is, is pretty much getting to a point now where um, companies like Deluxe and Technicolor are having to uh, wind down their lab services very rapidly, um, and uh, the number of prints is very, very low. Yes, I suppose there'll become a, a point very soon where it just is far too expensive to produce a print, so it's just not worth doing. Yes, um, that's not to say that um, Fuji and Kodak aren't still making stock, but the amount of stock required is very, very low. Um, and, and, and this isn't stock that, that kind of DL, a, a DOP still like to shoot, you know, a, a film stock on set. This is, this is actual prints for distribution to cinemas type stock. Or are they the same uh, thing? I, I really don't know. Well, well... Um, Release print stock is slightly different to um, camera stock. Yeah. Um, the, the base is a different colour. Uh, of course, it's clear on a print, and it's uh, sort of a, a, an interesting brown colour on, um, on, on negative stock. Um, and also, print stock tends to be polyester, which is quite strong, so it can withstand the rigours of um, film projection um, uh, day, off, day in, day out. Um, but uh, both have become... Um, a, a, almost a legacy product. Um, I hate to say they'll go away. I think film is still going to remain a capture format. And I think um, that will be um, the case for a very long time. But uh, the number of facilities that can process film and then telecine it in, an, in a dailies environment and produce um, dailies to go back to the editors on set, it's becoming more of a niche business. And um, I think there will be a few businesses that are very successful at continuing to do that. So I don't think film as a capture medium is going away anytime soon, but it is becoming a, a niche business. And, yeah. uh, you know, the industry needs to look at ways of making that still financially viable because there's still a demand for it. Interesting. So that's got us to, um, it sort of came of age and rapidly with the introduction of the uh, uh, projection facilities in cinemas. It's now, it's now effectively, certainly in Europe, almost there. Um, so, I think probably this is a good point to start thinking about what is it that's being delivered to cinemas and what form is it in? And is it sort of going along in a big can and a man in a van or, 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 or is it going down wire or what's happening? Well, when we started doing this um, just around six years ago, the only way of getting what's a couple of hundred gigabytes of data to a cinema was going to be either on a, uh, probably an LTO3 tape, um, that was or DLT, that was mooted at the time, or a hard drive. Uh, so um, hard drives became relatively popular. They're easily available, very reusable. Um, you don't need any special skills to, uh, to operate. Um, uh, you know, LTO requires uh, Linux skills uh, to, to, uh, to make it work. Um, it's easy to duplicate hard drive. Um, duplication equipment exists. So that's been the way everything's been delivered and it also followed the print model so if you're shipping prints to cinemas as the conversion took place you can also ship hard drives uh, following the same distribution path so the only thing that today remains um, the way it was done a hundred years ago is the distribution path it's still physical um, there are moves to move away from a physical distribution path um, the first one obviously being satellite um, the second one being uh, broadband, some sort of fiber technology. Um, the issue with broadband has always been speed, connectivity, yeah. network saturation. So 
that's really in its infancy at the moment. And because, uh, as you said, that the file sizes are what typically two or three hundred gig. Yes, and in fact, they're getting larger. Uh, oh, really? Why? Well, um, the first the first thing is movies are slightly longer this year than they were last year. Um, Didn't that doesn't help. Uh, the second thing is that uh, we have um, more three D, and you can't apply as much compression to three D. Uh, as, as you as you would like, um, you, you've got to make the left eye and the right eye the same frames, exactly the same size as a, a single frame of of, um, of of a 2D movie, and that means that uh, you you can't compress those any much much more than that. So yeah. so we have uh, increases in file size. We have more soundtracks, um, so 5.1 and 7.1 track. Um, so that adds um, data. Um, we started to get new sound formats like Dolby Atmos, which had quite a large data overhead, and high frame rate 3D pretty much doubles it. So of course, yes. with all of these various formats and the different in types of inventory, where we get a 2D, a 3D, a subtitle, 7.1, a 5.1, you're delivering quite a lot of data for just one release. So um, they're actually getting larger at the moment, the packages. So a terabyte wouldn't, wouldn't be crazy in a few years' time? Well, and in fact, a terabyte um, terabyte hard drives were used for distributing um, for uh, The Hobbit, um, which was high frame rate 3D, so that we could fit a, a 2D, a 3D, and a high frame rate 3D on the same piece of inventory. So that's um, that's that's not uncommon. Um, it is starting to happen so that uh, inventory management is easier. Uh, we think right. with electronic delivery that will go away because not every um, cinema is going to need uh, every single version, but at the moment with physical delivery, it's easy just to ship a hard drive, a single hard drive that has everything on it. Uh, and obviously, for that feature, a terabyte was required. Fantastic. It, um, it, what? Go on, sorry, Phil. I was going to say, it, 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 it does seem to be screaming out for a kind of peer to peer type network, something like, dare I say, it, BitTorrent. Um, because, I mean, with a, with, a, with a decent high end domesticated, so you kind of think you could distribute files of that size, you know, within, within, within a day. To, to, to which, you know, whichever cinemas, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe there are concerns around that, I don't know. I think um, one, one thing uh, the studios were very careful of when they, and in fact diligent about when they, uh, they drew up the DCI spec, uh, was that it should be very, very secure. The encryption method and the way security is handled with the, a digital cinema package is, is, is secure. So that when a hard drive with a DCP goes out into the public domain, it's not worth anybody trying to crack the crack the content. Yeah. And there's a couple of things there. Firstly, it's 128-bit AES encrypted. Um, secondly, each individual reel of picture and sound is individually encrypted. So even if you were able to do some sort of brute force attack on one um, one element, uh, you would only get that one element of picture or sound, and you wouldn't get the whole feature. Um, and thirdly, 70% of the DCI spec is about security and security management. Um, so even if you were to do some sort of peer-to-peer -peer sharing, um, it's, it's unlikely that you would have a security issue with the content. You're more likely to have a security issue with the platform on, what, um, on which you're hosting it. Sure. And I realize this is a slightly contentious issue, but um, security was very important, um, and it's not a particularly well-understood um, Part of the part of the process um, by by uh, a lot of uh, exhibitors and um, uh, some of the studios are very specific people who know exactly how it works. But uh, it, it's something that, uh, that that is actually quite robust. Um, so when you mention BitTorrent, um, a lot of people might say that really sounds bad because it's associated with file sure. sharing and piracy. But I mean, uh, uh, some sort of, you know, peer-to-peer -peer, a kin network, obviously they could use whatever protocol they chose, but yeah. but, 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 um, but uh, I mean, given that, that, that you've got, you know, hundreds of theatres all wanting the same content, it kind of seems sensible, I don't know. Well, I think, uh, I think the, the, the one thing we've, we've found looking at this is uh, one of the issues has been not necessarily the connectivity available, uh, it's the cost of it. Right. Um, distributing a hard drive. I mean, a hard drive is um, costs about, I think, around a hundred pounds to buy it, um, with packaging and all hmm. closing effort that goes into it. Um, you know, you, you're you're able to um, distribute very cheaply. Uh, in order to buy a connection, go into a cinema, uh, 
that will then service it with its content and also any of the back-end network infrastructure to do that. It's still relatively expensive with a view to being able to get that content there within a day. Um, secondly, you've got to look at network saturation. Even though you may be able to get 30 or 50 megabits per second to a particular site, um, if you've got three sites and they're all on that same local metro net, mm. um, you may saturate that network with two deliveries. So the third cinema has to wait. Um, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure that needs to go in, um, and it is happening. Uh, but we have to look at it very carefully to see where that infrastructure is going to be appropriate for um, delivering these uh, these files and making sure that the distributed studio doesn't get any dark screens on release day. Sure. So, yeah, so, so with that in mind, can we just spit back a tiny bit? And yeah. Um, so, so, so we're thinking about files being distributed currently over over you, you know hard drives in a nice robust kind of carrier in a can, and and of course that may be a, a sort of an electronically distributed file in the future. But it's a JPEG two thousand file, the the digital cinema um, standard, um, which to me, a, a kind of an old a video guy. An iframe codec, that kind of seems counterintuitive, you know, a delivery format as an iframe codec. Um, w can you explain to us, uh, Lawrence, why, why, they don't, why they didn't go for a long gop um, codec for, for distributing what's finished content? I, I'm, I'm, I was, I've been curious about this myself, um, and uh, it could, you know, uh, certain earlier di digital cinema releases that were done with an MPEG-2 um, codec um, were... Uh, some of them were long got, but uh, a lot of them were iframe only. One thing we realized when we, we got into this is um, even though it's a delivery format for exhibition, you still got to edit it. Um, and we are requiring the replay device in each theatre to, in some cases, edit bits of the movie together. Mm -hmm. so the first thing you're doing is you're still treating the film as reels. So you still got a 20 minute chunk of video. 20 minute chunk of audio and it's got an in and an out point and we still generally include the heads and tails with the countdowns and the sync pop on them um but what you do is oh, really? so so the the construct of a digital cinema package is to have um picture elements and sound elements so real one video real one audio real two video real, real two audio and then there's a, 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 a file called the composition playlist which looks a little bit like an edit decision list in that it says um, start at reel one at this frame, picture and sound, so usually it's 192, or 12 feet or whatever, um, and come out at this frame and then run the next one. So you're actually requiring the replay device to cut those together. The benefit of doing this, although it may sound a little bit silly to start with, the benefit of doing this is for um, a French dubbed version, we can create a new main title, which is quite often the first two, 3,000 frames, a uh, brand new title sequence, um, and that's something our visual effects department does. Uh, and that allows us to ship the original version and also a track file that contains the new front, uh, you know, uh, main title section. We'll also replace various locator cards within, within the feature and anything else that um, requires translation um, for the local language. So uh, this means that you are still requiring an editable format. Um, and this really is part of the reason why individual iframe JPEG 2000 um, is appropriate for cinema. Um, the other reason it was chosen was purely to differentiate it from, um, from video and broadcast. Um, the, um, the, the committee that, that did it decided they wanted to make sure it was a, more of a um, more akin to film which has individual frames than, uh, than having a, a sort of a long got format. And so, just quick, I know you probably know the numbers, but a top of my head calculation, uh, a, a 300 or a 500 gigabyte file for like an hour and a half cinema presentation. What are we talking about here? What, how many megabits per second are we talking? Uh, well, the DCI spec caps at 250 megabits per second. Only, only 250 megabits? Why? Only 250. Um, now, there is some move to increase this. Um, I think when the original uh, the original figure was decided upon, um, firstly it was done for various technology limitations, and secondly sure. it was deemed to be sufficient for the 35 millimeter film capture. And in some cases, they also did some 70 millimeter film capture at the time. Um, one thing we've certainly seen in early tests is some of the new digital capture formats, where um, where you've got uh, you're capturing very very high resolution. 
Um, I know some of the Sony F65 footage compressed at 250 megabits a second. There are a few demonstrations that show um, a lot of the detail um, being lost as a result of that. So there are some moves within the studios, um, particularly the particular technical folk at the studios, to say it needs to be at least 500 megabits a second. Um, and uh, so with high frame rate 3D, you already have to increase it by virtue of the fact that you've got more frames per second. So, so they're going to go beyond the data rate you were getting for D1 videotape 25 years ago. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, so you've hinted at content protection, uh, Lawrence. Can you, can you just dive into that a bit more? So it's, it's, it's 128-bit AES encrypted on the hard drive that leaves Deluxe Daring Street to go to the, th the theatre. Um, how does the key to decrypt that arrive at the theatre? Um, the key the method of delivery for the key is uh, usually email. That seems to be the lowest common denominator for doing this. Um, so so li li literally, whoever's prepping a, 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 a film to go out on a on a on a um, on a hard drive, they're emailing a, a a file which is a key to projectionist at whatever you know the, the cinema. No, how, how does it actually arrive at the at the, the Doremi server in in the projection booth in the cinema? Typically, it has to be copied onto a, a USB stick and then right. um, plugged into the the theatre management system or the individual re replay device. So um, the issue of life keys, KDMs and licensing is, is actually a bit of a logistical nightmare. Um, I, I like to call it licensing because it's just like any other form of digital rights management. But um, in order to make a key to decrypt a feature, firstly, you've got to know um, which replay device you're targeting at. So each screen has a replay device in it, a replay server. Um, and we have to keep a database of every single replay server and where it is um, it, for the whole, of, the whole of the world. We have to keep that updated. Um, and that information is transmitted manually. Now, for other forms of digital rights management, um, generally speaking, the box would be connected to the internet, which is not something that's really been done. Um, so from a logistical standpoint, it would have been great to go back six years and say, when you install a new replay device, you need to connect it to the internet and register it. You can unplug it again afterwards, but it does need to be registered, so it's this device at this location. Um, the other thing is it would be great to send um, decryption KDMs directly to the replay device, and then you've got no people involved. Hmm. Um, so at the moment, you've got people doing the, uh, the database management, what's installed where, and you've also got people having to take the KDMs on the whole and plug them into the replay device. And we feel this is something that needs to be addressed by the industry. Um, it's a big problem, and yeah. uh, I think it would be, you know, it needs a big solution. Um, but I think this is going to come with network delivery. Once you've got a network connection into the cinema, you'll be able to administer licensing a lot more easily um, and also be able to register devices um, to a central database a lot more easily because you just need to scan the network to find out what's installed where and get the information back automatically. So these aren't really technical problems, they're, they're, they're more political and uh, financial problems uh, and perhaps a touch of logistics but mostly it's, it, there's no real technical issue. No, there's not, not a huge technical issue at all. Um, there's already a, um, a basic uh, um, interchange format for information about how uh, what, what replay server is installed, and it's called um, a facility list message, or an FLM. Um, so you can interrogate a replay device, and it will spit back an XML file that um, contains what its serial number is, what its trusted device certificate is, and, and, and where to go and get that. So um, it's possible to recover that information electronically quite easily. Um, we also have a, a KDM delivery protocol which works with Regal Cinemas in the States, which is a hands-off process. Um, keys come out of our KDM generation system and they get delivered direct to the replay server. So um, you load the content and it's already licensed. So the one thing you touched on there, Lawrence, is is the variety of um, playback servers. And, and I know whenever I've been working at Deluxe or, or, or other places, you, you commonly see Doremi and Dolby and DVS Clipsters and things like that. What, what, what's the typical kind of pre penetration you know, out there in the cinemas and the Odeons and the views and things like that? What, 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 what servers are kind of popular in cinemas? 
Well, uh, certainly Doremi and Dolby have an enormous market share, and I think Doremi really uh, has has got a huge um, a huge install base, probably closely followed by Dolby. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers. Um, you then have other manufacturers uh, which seem to be popular um, in uh, in the Far East. GDC is a Far Eastern manufacturer. Um, they're incredibly innovative and um, they make an incredibly good product. And uh, they're very popular in Korea and uh, Thailand uh, and um, and China. So uh, there's um, there's a there's a fairly wide variety. And um, there's an Indian manufacturer called Cube who also make a very successful product. Um, uh, one of the the uh, integrators uh, do their own product um, called the um, XDC G3, uh, which is also also quite popular in in Central Europe. Um, so the, there are a number of different manufacturers, um, and now also there are a few OEM products that can be incorporated into a manufacturer's replay device. Um, Micron make a media block. Um, DVS also make a PCI card that you can use to make a um, a replay server. So it, it's getting easier and we think the variety of different replay devices um, will increase and is, in fact is already increasing. And typically if you've got a, a Sony 4K or, or whatever kind of projector you've got in your cinema, what's what's the interconnect between the server and the projector? Is it is it multi-link HDSDI or, or is it is it HDMI or, or, or something different? Uh, well this has been changing recently. Um, one of the reasons is to uh, to, to move fully to the, the, the DCI standard for security. Um, and originally, uh, when this was, um, when, when the format was new, if you like, it was dual link HDSDI, but it was an extension to the format that allowed uh, a 2048 um, pixel raster rather than 1920. Hmm. Uh, it was also 444 and 12 bit packed rather than, rather than 10 bit, like normal yeah. bit. So, uh, so it's slightly different, and um, the encryption standard that was used on that was a thing called CineLink 2, which was developed by Texas Instruments, um, and that allowed the, um, the data to be encrypted between the replay server and the projector. Uh, so that maintained a certain level of security. The move has been to remove the, um, the, the decryption from the, the box that carries the data and actually put that into the projector. Um, to get towards what's called a, a full secure media block. So you have one box and it's within the projector and you put encrypted data in and the, only, the first time you see it outside of that box is when the picture comes out of the lens onto the screen. Um, so the idea being if you unscrew this box whilst it's working, the encryption shuts down and the, the, the data is null and void. Uh, the media block um, replay system also allows for a proprietary high data rate um, uh, format to exist between the replay device and the projector head. So that then allows for 4K and it allows for high frame rate 3D, much higher than 250 megabits per second, all the limitations of the old uh, HDSDI format. So well, moving on from that a little bit, um, the the projectors, what, what's, what, what projectors you were talking about, the, the variety of um, uh, uh, servers, is there a similar variety in projectors, or is it all coming down to Sony and Sons? Um, well, you've got uh, really two, um, two, two types of projector. You've got the, the <coughs> instruments-based projectors, which there are only three licensees for making full digital cinema quality projectors. Um, you have Barco, Christie, and uh, NEC. Um, and uh, Sony who have made their own product, which is based on um, a, it's a reflective liquid crystal uh, technology um, called SXRD. Um, I think probably um, Sony would uh, would um, uh, not describe it necessarily as a liquid crystal technology um, uh, because that has connotations of rather older older way of doing things. It's a little bit more clever than that, but. Um, uh, SXRD has been very successful. Uh, Sony were the first company to be able to make a 4K resolution projector um, successfully, um, and uh, these have become very, very popular with a with a couple of um, certainly a couple of UK cinema chains. Um, both U Cinemas and uh, Showcase uh, are 100% Sony. Uh, oh, right. So okay. if you if you go to a View or a Showcase, you'll see a, um, an image projected by a 4K Sony projector. Um, There's a matter of interest. Is that is that Technology related to to the to the short-lived Sony uh, 
uh, scanner. Do you remember the, the old telecine they had? I can't remember what it was called now. Do you remember? The Vialta. Vialta, yes. Is that, is that related? I, I, I'm not sure if there's any related technology in there. Um, I think the Vialta was a CCD, so it was really like a TV. It might have been, yeah. Was, so yeah. I can't remember what it was. Yeah. Um, um, uh, but I know the, uh, the certainly Sony was playing about 10 years ago with a, with a technology called GLV, which is grating light valve. Um, so it was like a sort of a, a, a silicon ribbon. Um, or two silicon ribbons that would, would that would move, and you'd fire a laser through it, and it would it would effectively create a create a scanned raster on the screen. Um, I think there were a number of um, safety issues with this particular product, in that the lasers required at the time were similar to what you'd use for cutting through sheets of metal. So. Uh, but from what I gather, it produced very very successful images, but it was very much an R and D project. So. Um, they moved away from that and uh, and focused on SXRD for a display as a display technology. And just like DLP, um, over the last five or six years, this has come on leaps and bounds. They've improved uh, image uniformity, temperature stability, and I think they've been able to stretch the technology beyond what anyone ever expected it to be able to do. So um, they've got a very successful product now. And I, I looked at the new Sony projector only last week. Um, down at Sony and Basingstoke, and it, it did indeed produce incredibly good images. And so, if, you, if you're a theatre owner, Lawrence, and, and you're thinking, "Oh, yeah, you know, we're upgrading to digital, and we'd like a, a, a sort of an R220 or an R320," what, what, what sort of money are, are those kind of projectors? I, I don't know what they sell for in bulk, um, but <laughs> I know that uh, they're certainly certainly you they're a lot cheaper than they used to be. When I was when we were shipping the first 2K DLP machines back in 2005. Um, you were lucky to be able to get a projector and a server for much less than about seventy-five thousand um, pounds. So uh, today, uh, I think we're around uh, sort of the thirty-five to forty thousand pound mark for a replay device and a projector if you're buying a number of them. Um, and a number of financing options exist to get that equipment in. Um, there are various financing models that mean the studios, uh, although I don't think these are available for very much longer um, for a what's called a virtual print fee. So the cinema would have had a 35 millimeter print because the, the, the um, distributor no longer has to pay the cost of a 35 millimeter print. They make a contribution to the exhibitor and then the financing body recovers some of that money from the, from the studio uh, once, once the film is played. Uh, so if you're so, thinking of starting a cinema chain, now's the time to do it. Don't tally. Okay. I, I would say I would say now is the time to do it. Um, there is, and I forget the name of it, and I, I, I apologise to, to, to the folks, uh, but there is actually a, a cooperative body, certainly in the UK, that is assisting with this. In the Norway, in Norway, there was a lot of government money. Um, in France, there was a bit of government help as well. So um, there have been a number of financial incentives to assist with the conversion from film to digital. Um, uh, if you look at the graph um, now, in retrospect, uh, Avatar also helped. There was a huge jump in installations just before Avatar, and in some cases, uh, some independent cinemas have put their hands in their pockets and paid for them outright. So it was a, there was a sort of a pre-Avatar, post-Avatar moment that really gave the industry a kick towards digital. It's funny. It does seem to be those um, those events. I can remember re- reading that um, the big uptake of television in the nineteen fifties was the uh, the coronation, coronation, yes. and and um, and the big uptake of colour was the nineteen seventy six uh, Olympic Games, and uh, it, it seems that those uh, sort of big sort of tent poles sort of events that uh, that drive these things a bit. Well, which is all all well and good, but it leaves out the sound. So how does the sound work? Let's talk about audio for a little bit. Um. Audio is an interesting topic, and it's a little bit of a pet topic of mine anyway. Um, one of the things that the studios are very co- conscious of is that all of the sound formats that had been provided to the industry um, over the previous 25 years had mainly been um, produced by one company, which was Dolby. Not forgetting Sony uh, with the SDDS format and DTS in, in 1993 coming on the scene. Uh, but most of it had been proprietary, which um, was uh, good because uh, one company was responsible for making sure that worked, um, and they did an incredible job of that. Um, but also, uh, the industry said, with the DCI spec, maybe we need to go for more um, a, a non-proprietary format. 
um, to start with. So um, linear PCM was the chosen format. There's no compression. Um, the, we can put as many tracks on there as we like. And they said, let's have 16, because we can't think of as many as 16 tracks today. And they presupposed where loudspeakers might go um, where they aren't today. Um, and also uh, additional tracks for um, metadata and for um, off-screen effects and um, audio description and hearing impaired. So uh, audio has been in the specification 16 channels of, um, of linear PCM, the 24-bit. 24 bits? Uh, 24 bits. And what, 48 so, or 96K um, sample? 40, 96 is in the spec. Um, no one's done one so far. Right, um, okay. I believe that's probably because a lot of the dubbing studios still don't have um, full 96K capability sure. in the whole um, mixing chain. Um, but 24-bit uh, 48 is, is the general standard. 5.1 or 7.1. Um, 7.1 is now settled into the, moved away from the Sony five channels behind the screen and um, now has four surround channels and three channels behind the screen by subwoofer. Uh, more recently, we've had um, two new sound formats uh, arriving for digital cinema. One of them is uh, marketed by Barco called Oro. Uh, and this uses um, some of the unused, least significant bits to encode additional channels. And it allows for up to 13.1 in a conventional arrangement with surrounds at ear level, surrounds up high, and surround speakers above your head, um, but also has three height channels above the screen. So you've got your normal left, center, and right. It has got left, center, and right at the top of the screen. Um, and this is something IMAX has been, um, you know, has been doing for years, where they have a sort of a height channel. Uh, the other format that's sort of um, making inroads is Dolby Atmos, which is a very different way of doing things. Um, it I has haven't a, come across that. So, yeah, give, explain what, what, what's different about it. Well, Dolby Atmos doesn't record the channels discrete. Um, Barco Oro still records individual channels discreetly. Um, uh, Dolby Atmos has a um, what they call a bed mix, um, and that bed mix can be 5.1 or 7.1, and in fact, I think it supports up to 9.1 in a conventional arrangement. But then what they do is do something that's quite popular in gaming, which is to record a mono track with a panning data. So effectively, um, you then have an array of loudspeakers around the room, an array above, above your head, um, and you can move the sound from any one of those loudspeakers to any other loudspeaker. Uh, this, is, um, this can be used, or I think will be used, for some fairly um, special uh, audio in future. And I think um, everyone's trying to um, work out you know, what they can actually do with it at the moment. There's, there's more flexibility than, than, than a lot of sound mixers are, are used to with even 5.1 or 7.1. So um, it, it, it allows you to pinpoint a sound anywhere in sort of three hours. Wow. So but but live in the, actually live in the in the theatre itself in the auditorium as opposed yeah. to being pre-mixed. So you could in fact envisage um, having an audience participating and actually taking some feedback from the audience, plugging it into the Atmos and actually changing the position of sounds. I can't imagine why you'd want to do it, but but you could actually do so. Or, or pr I, I presumably the, the the Atmos processor, which is at the moment is a Dolby eight fifty. Is that right? That's, that's correct. So yeah. presumably the, the 850 knows about the room that it's installed in and and tailors all those kind of vectors and moving things accordingly. Is, is, is that the idea? That, that's right. It has to look at the speaker array and map the sounds. You say where you want the sound and it will map the, surround, the, the sound in 3D space to wherever the loudspeakers um, are located. Uh, I think it's an interesting format because it and we've just been through this ourselves uh, at Deluxe, it's quite a difficult format to retrofit to an existing theatre um, because whereas you'd have a bank of surround loudspeakers which are relatively small, um, all producing enough sound pressure level to, to get to the audience uh, to match the, the, the larger stage channels, you're actually requiring each individual speaker to be able to produce um, 105 dB peak at the, the listening point. So you actually need to take these speakers off the wall and put quite a lot quite large loudspeakers um, around the sides and above you um, and replace a lot of amplifiers. So it's quite an undertaking to install it. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how quick the uptake is. But um, certainly from the demonstrations I've heard, it's, it's incredibly compelling. 
Interesting. Uh, and presumably the setup, once the speakers are hung and, 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 and the amplifiers are powered up, presumably the setup is quite involved. I mean, lots of sort of impulse and, and broadband sort of noises as you walk around with a microphone and, and model the room for the, six, for the 850. I've not actually seen this done. And funnily enough, the um, Dolby engineers were in today, but we haven't actually got the system powered up yet. So maybe that's <laughs> a, 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 a discussion for a, for a future future podcast. But um, oh, so, so you've you've got one of these things already, yeah? We have got one of these things, right. but um, it's very early days at the moment. Um, it's supposed to auto auto align itself. I think um, having EQ'd a few 5.1 and 7.1 systems, um, doing, I think in our small room, we've got about. 36, 35 or 36 individual channels, EQing all of that would take forever. So I think it's got an automated process that, um, that, that does a lot of that for you. Uh, but I, I think you're absolutely right. You have to map where the loudspeakers are in 3D mm. space um, to the track so that the processor knows where it's panning the, pan, panning the sounds to. So obviously all this, all this idea of, of um, you know, films being produced with with digital inter- well, I suppose it end to end now. Um, you know things being shot on red ones and Alexas and D twenty ones and things like that. Yeah. An entirely digital workflow in in the um, post production and effects chain, and then a digital delivery to the cinema. Uh, you, you know, I mean, presumably, increasingly, there are lots of films now where the images don't see celluloid from one end to the next. And I suppose the thing I've always wondered about is, does this mean cinemas will be able to extend their remit a bit and show? You know, sort of live football matches or, or, or concerts and things like that. Do you, can, do, you, do you see that coming at all? Um, I think uh, in some cases it's already happening and it's it, it, in, in certain areas where you've got the right demographic and the right kind of content, it's incredibly successful. Um, via satellite, um, there's a very big demand for the Metropolitan Opera. Um, yes, Mark Shubin, um, who, who I, I follow a bit, he seems to be, sort of, that seems to be his bag. Yeah, um, uh, uh, ballet is also incredibly popular. Um, the cinema owner gets a higher ticket price um, for the seat, um, and uh, that seems to work incredibly well. Um, football doesn't quite work so well in cinemas because people tend to like to have a beer in their hand when they're watching the football. So um, I, I think um, that's something that, that that's a, that, that's a genre that doesn't work quite so well. Um, rock concerts also are, you know, that they work, but um, you know, a cinema environment with seat, seating isn't always the right the right place for that kind of thing. Uh, but but these these events do tend to work quite well, and um, the, the the quality is very good, um, and providing it's prepared correctly, uh, I think um, I think it it will do very well. And certainly the cinema owners are very happy with the the early results they've had with some of these um, some of these events. Well, that leads us off to the future. And I think a good place to bring this podcast um, to a natural conclusion for the moment, because there's obviously lots that's going to be talked about in, in months and years to come. Lawrence, thank you very much indeed for, for taking the time to chat to us about that. It's been really fascinating. Lots of stuff I didn't know. Um, I'm not sure what our next one will be, Phil. I know we've you've got a couple um, of ideas coming up here. Um, got got a few things um, uh, brewing, um, particularly uh, some of the new technologies we've been installing in this big um, uh, independent broadcast, the job I've been doing in Manchester for the last few months. Some nice things have come out of that. I mean, sort of things that I think are quite innovative and, and worth talking about. So so we'll probably think about those things. Uh, and I still have yet to get to grips with my Raspberry Pi. So, uh, so I probably... <laughs> Me too. Yes, I, I've still got my Raspberry Pi in my Christmas box. So, Lawrence, you're not a Raspberry Pi man yet, are you? Um, no, but I've been looking at them longingly, and, one, <laughs> and I'm going to sort of get get myself out again and start doing some some basic bash scripting or something like that. So, yes. uh, so, so yeah, yeah I, I'm I'm sure I can embroil myself in that at some point. Good. Well, we'll, we'll invite you back for a for a, a a pie up, a community pie get together when we finally got it. But thank you very much indeed, and uh, that's been a most fascinating. Uh, episode really thank you very much indeed thank you chap we'll uh we'll 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 see you soon you phil thank you bye-bye